Hi everybody, welcome to the second electrostatics lesson. As you can see from behind me, we have the same demo as in the last lesson. Now, just to review really quickly, two balloons, both of equal mass, both of which have been charged already. You can tell from the separation between the two. Now, we don't know what the relative charges are, but we do know they're the same sign of charge because they're repelling each other. And the fact that we actually don't know the values doesn't matter at all because we know that it is a action-reaction pair. So the force on the left balloon is equal to the force on the right balloon. As we established last time, if we drew a vertical line up here and we measured the angle between the balloon strings and the vertical, and we measured the mass of the balloons, we could actually determine what the electrostatic force between the two balloons is. All right, so now, what I want to do is I want to look at the distance between the two balloons, right? The right balloon is some distance away from the left balloon, and the left balloon is some distance from the right balloon. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to pop the left balloon, and I want to observe what happens to the right balloon. Ready? Oh, not quite. Let's get, let him set back up. And left and right are switching. Okay. <laughs> One more try. There we go. Okay, so if we take a look at this balloon, what's happened is the string has moved from an angle to vertical. If we think about why that is, well, the electrostatic force has disappeared. It's no longer acting on this balloon. The force of gravity is acting down on the balloon. Tension only has to act up to keep the balloon from accelerating downwards. It doesn't have to keep it in static equilibrium in the x direction. But my question now is, what happened at that distance, let's call it D, that was between the two balloons before, right? The other balloon was some distance over here, right? But it seems like whatever this balloon had just disappeared as soon as I popped the other balloon. And that's, that's really bizarre, isn't it, right? The, by affecting one, I've changed a property of this one. It no longer has an effect. Well, to test to see if there is still something here in what seems to be empty space, I have a, another balloon, right? So I'm gonna charge this balloon up quickly and I'm gonna bring it near to the, the existing balloon and we're gonna see what happens. If it has an effect on the hanging balloon, that means the hanging balloon must still have something going on in this empty space, something that can influence this balloon and that allows it to be influenced. So let's go ahead and test this out. You can already see it's starting to move, right? right? And there you have it. That hanging balloon still has something, even though this appears to all be empty space. There is some sort of a property of this balloon, of the charges on the balloon, that's generating an influence in the empty space around it. So that's what we're gonna explore next in the lesson. Try being better at that. So. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine our balloon as this big negative charge right here, right? Because we know that our balloon is negative. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a charge, let's say right here. And I'm going to call this charge Q2, okay? And then over here, at an equal distance away, I'm going to put a charge Q1. I know that's a weird order. Uh, there's really no reason for it. So if I look at Q1, I can say that there's an electrostatic force on one of K, we'll call the balloon capital Q, K capital Q, Q1 over R squared. Here for two, I can say that there's an electrostatic force on two equal to K Q, Q2 over R squared, okay? Then I can look at a charge over here. That's a distance of, we'll call it capital R away. I'll call this Q3. This has an electrostatic force, uh, excuse me, electrostatic force of three of K, Q, Q3 over capital R squared. Then if I have another one, which is the same distance capital R away, call it Q4. I can say that F4E is K capital Q, Q4 over R squared. And so here what you can see is I'm just drawing what the forces are at these given points if they are some distance R away at some value of charge. Okay, 
what you start to notice is um, there are some similarities between these two charges and these two charges, and that similarity being the distance means that anything that sort of falls on a radius, oh, let me use a colored marker here, anything that falls on a, a radial distance away here or a radial distance away here that's the same will have something similar to each other. Okay, so before we go any further with the electrostatic part, I want to take a brief detour into gravity. So let's go ahead and let's replace our balloon with a mass. And this mass will be the Earth. Okay. Well, I can say if I take another mass here, well, maybe a satellite, and I call it M1, that will experience a force of gravity equal to capital G, mass of the Earth, I'll call it capital M, times M1 over, let's call this distance here, R over R squared. I can take another mass, M2, put it over here. I can say that this mass is a distance r away, and F2g is therefore g, capital M for the Earth, M2 over r squared. We really have the same kind of deal going on here, don't we? Well, look at these two equations. Going back to this idea that everything that is a radial distance of r away from the source of gravity, which is the Earth, will have something in common. Well, let's look at what that thing in common is. F1g is g capital M over r squared times m1, right? This thing here. Here we have g capital M over r squared m2. Well, look, this is the same as this. As, and any single mass that lies on this green dashed line, which is a radial distance of r away from the Earth, if that was an actual circle, unfortunately, I'm not very good at drawing those, will have this same value. Now, what is this? What is this thing that we're looking at? What is gm over r squared? What on Earth is that? Well, let's look at an example that is, again, the Earth. But we're going to look at an object that's just right on the surface of the Earth right there. Well, then, we know some stuff. We know that Newton's gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. I know, thanks to Google, that the mass of the Earth is about 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And I know that the radius of the Earth, which is effectively what our R was over here, right, is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. So we can go ahead and we can plug this in. We can plug in gm over r squared for the values here. And when you do that, what you find is that the answer is 9 point seven eight and if we follow the units we get that it is meters per second squared well this number should look very very familiar to us this is lowercase g right this is the acceleration due to gravity of an object on the surface of the earth now of course it's a little bit off in the 9.81 we usually use but you can see it's close enough okay well what that tells me, right, is that this value of g is connected to the distance you are away from the Earth. If I go further away, I get a smaller and smaller g. We knew that already. What we also knew is that this g is what we call the gravitational field. It's the field generated by the Earth distances away from the Earth itself, the source of mass. 
And so if we look here, right, the gravitational field at this position looks like this. At this position, it looks like this. At this position, it looks like this. And I can draw these all as my lowercase g's, and I'll use the little vector sign because, of course, the acceleration due to gravity, what we traditionally have been calling this thing, is in fact the gravitational field. It's a vector, right? It has a direction along with its magnitude. Here on the surface of the Earth, we'd say it is 9.78 or 81 meters per second squared down, right, towards the center of the Earth. Okay, so now that we've done this with gravity, what I want to do, actually, I guess I'll put this over here. I want to circle back to this. Nope, that's more crooked. Okay, so here, let's take a look. Well, F2e, I can rewrite as kq over r squared times q2. For one, I can write kq over r squared times q1. Down here, I have kq over capital R squared times q4. Here, I have k capital Q over r squared times q3. So we're starting to see something very, very similar to what we saw before. And so I can make a general statement. I can say that in general, anything on this line has an electrostatic force equal to kq over r squared times whatever the value of that charge placed on that line is. And I can say the same thing up here, except up here, it'll just be kq over lowercase r squared times whatever the charge may be. So connecting that back to the balloon from before, this is really what's causing the influence of the balloon that wasn't popped to still be there. There's still something right there. And what we're gonna do is just like with gravity, we're gonna call this thing the electric field. Okay. It's this quantity that is present a position away. And even though we can't see it, just like we can't see the acceleration due to gravity, we can see it's an effect, right? We can see the effect of it pulling down on a mass when I drop it. We can't see the electrostatic, uh, excuse me, the electric field until we put a charge there, like when I put the second balloon there, and then we see the effect of that field. But just like the gravitational field is actually here, that electric field is also actually present. Okay. Oh, running out of paper here. Okay, so now that electric field is, is a physical quantity, so we're going to give it a variable. Its variable is going to be E. Now, just like the acceleration due to gravity, it has to be a vector. It has to point in some direction, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. We've also found right, the electric field is this stuff in here, and so as you have probably figured out the equation for it is going to be k times q over r squared right where q is what i'm going to call the source charge it's the charge that's responsible for the presence of the electric field in in our case in the demonstration it was the hanging balloon r is the distance from the source charge The further away you go, the weaker that field is going to be, which makes sense, right? The further the balloon was from the other balloon, the weaker the force was. All right, so continuing forward. The question now is about the direction of that field, right? The direction of the, the electric field. Well, with gravity, it's very simple, right? 
it's going to always point towards that mass because gravity is an inherently attractive force. It always wants to pull towards the Earth. But we know that the electrostatic force is different. Sometimes the electrostatic force repels, sometimes it attracts. So when we talk about the direction, we're going to base it off of a positive charge. And we call this a positive test charge. And what that really is, is it's a charge that is extremely, extremely small. We call it basically infinitesimally small. And we say that it's positive. So if we look here at our balloon example, if we look at Q1, well, at Q1, what direction is the field? It doesn't matter what Q1 is. It can be positive or negative. The field is determined off of a convention, which is the positive test charge. So the question really is, if I put a positive test charge where Q1 was, what direction would it go? Well, it would want to move towards the negative, right? So then I can say that this is the electric field at this point. I can say here, the electric field is like this, right? They're both pointing towards the negative sign. Now suppose I put a negative charge at Q3. What direction is the field due to the balloon or the source charge here? Well, again, doesn't matter that it's negative. I'm asking, given the source charge, well, if this is a positive test charge, even if I put a negative charge here, the positive test charge is gonna go this way and I'm gonna deliberately draw my electric field vector smaller because it's further away and as the distance increases, we need to have the electric field go down. Okay, so that can be a little bit confusing. The key here, right, is that we base it off of a positive test charge. Otherwise, it can be pointing towards the negative or away from the negative, which is not a problem with gravity, again, because gravity only ever attracts. So we'll define the direction of that electric field as the force that would be exerted on a very tiny positive test charge, okay? And in fact, we define the electric field as the force that exists on an infinitely small positive test charge. But I find that when I give this definition, things get a little bit confusing because what are you talking about as force when there's no force there because there's no second charge, right? What do you mean by infinitely small? What is a positive test charge? What's really important here is to recognize that at any position away from some charge, the charge itself, what I've defined as the source charge, still has an influence. There's still something there. And when I put that thing there, suddenly it experiences a force and the direction of the electric field is determined by that positive test charge. All right, so now if we look at a example like, let's just say I put a, a positive charge right here, right? I can say I have a point A here and a point B here. I'm not gonna give you any values, but all I wanna establish is that the electric field at A is greater than the electric field at B because RA is smaller than RB and the R is in the denominator. We also can establish that that electric field itself is pointing away and it's again going to be larger for A than it is for B. Now, we can look at an example. And this example is, imagine we have a straight line. Okay? And on the straight line, I'm gonna put a Q1 
and we're going to look at a point P over here. And I tell you that Q1 is a distance D away from point P. And what we want to do is we want to find E P. Okay. We want to find the electric field, including the direction at point P. And I'll tell you that Q1 is going to be equal to positive three picocoulombs. And R is going to be equal, excuse me, D is going to be equal to one micrometer. Well, E is equal to KQ1. That's my source charge, isn't it? That's, that's what's creating the electric field that we're interested in over D squared, because that's our, our R in this case. We're going to plug that in. And what we end up getting is 2.7 times 10 to the 10. And our, un uh, excuse me, our units will come out to be Newtons per Coulomb. But notice I have not included the direction. Well, just like we did with forces, we're going to sort of conceptually come up with our direction. Q1 is positive, right? Here's point P. I'm imagining a little tiny positive test charge at point P. Which way will that positive test charge move if this is positive? Well, it's going to be a repulsion. So it's going to be in that direction. And so I can say that it's this to the right. Or I can define to the right to be positive and say, OK, positive 2.7 times 10 to the 10 Newtons per Coulomb. Right? And there we go. We have solved the problem. But now, what if I said that, let me just kind of separate this a little bit. We place a negative two picocoulomb charge at position P, okay? And now we wanna find what is the force on the negative two picocoulomb charge. How can we do that? Well, we can use our electrostatic force equation, which is K, that's gonna be Q1, Q2 over R squared. But then we can also recognize that this is KQ1 over R squared times Q2. This is our electric field equation for our source charge, which is Q1. So this is really equal to the electric field at point P times Q2, which is this value times the negative two picocoulombs, right? And what we end up getting is 0 0.054 Newtons. But we can't lose track of this, right? There's a direction. Well, two ways to approach this. The first one is to look at it conceptually. If I actually put a negative charge here, right? If I put a negative charge here, which way will it move? Well, the force would be to the left. It's attractive. So this becomes negative. The other way to do it is to recognize that my electric field is a vector. I made it positive. I can plug in a negative Q for this, and I'll actually get my negative sign to come out. Uh, I like to lean towards the conceptual way of doing it over the mathematical way because I find that I get my answer. Uh, it allows me to really check over my answers. This also leads us to another equation for the electric field. Excuse me, not for the electric field, but the electrostatic force. I can now say that the electrostatic force is equal to EQ. Or over here, I can say that this is equal to the electrostatic force over the charge. And those are my electric field equations. Okay. Now, superposition. Just like we did with force, this still works. We can still do this. I can look at a line. I'm not going to do a full problem. And I can place a Q1. And I'll call Q1 positive. Okay, it's positive Q1. I can place a Q2. And I can say Q2 is negative. 
then I can ask, okay, what is the electric field at point P again? Well, what I'll do is I'll make sort of a free body diagram and I'll look at point P and again, we're saying, what if I put a little tiny positive charge here? What's it gonna do? Well, ignore Q2, Q1 will push it. So that's gonna be my electric field due to one. Q2 is going to pull point P. Still this way, that's E2. And so then the electric field at point P is going to be E1 plus E2, which getting rid of the vectors because they're both to the right, E1 plus E2, or K. Q1 is the source for E1 over, I'll just define these distances to be R, R squared, plus K Q2 over R squared. And so if I gave you numbers, you can see how to go about solving that. Okay. Back to our charges. Imagine we have this positive charge on the paper right here. And we look at three different points that lie on a, a line that points radially out. And we'll call them A, B and C. Well, as we've already established, right, we can say that EA is going to point away like that, B like this, C like this, gradually getting weaker and weaker and weaker because EA is closer. So EA is greater than EB, which is greater than EC. Well, we can draw lines all around this positive charge. And what we'd find at each and every line is that we have some value of force on an infinitesimally small positive object, or in other words, an electric field, that point away like this. So we can continue to draw them. And what we find is that all of them point radially away from the positive charge, just like this. Okay. These are what we call electric field lines, okay? And they're really visual representations of what the field looks like around a charge. Now, this is a terrible drawing, but I'll draw a better one in just a little bit. If I want to draw, uh, define my electric field lines, um, I'm going to just do this, okay? These are lines representing the direction a positive test charge would experience a force in. So the direction that a positive test charge would experience a force in, and I wanna add here actually, when placed near an arrangement of charges. So I can have multiple source charges, like I, I dealt with with superposition, and then the electric field lines represent the direction of force that an object placed there would in fact experience. If I instead had a negative charge like my balloon, I would find that any positive charge place would be pulled towards it. And so my field lines would look like this, extending away from the charge, right? And with arrows pointing towards it, okay? Because no matter where I place a positive charge, it's going to move towards that negative sign, or excuse me, not toward, it's not gonna to move towards, it's going to experience a force towards it. Now, as we've established a couple times already, if I define two points, A and B, the electric field at A is gonna be greater than the electric field of B. Students often ask, okay, is there some sort of a rule for how we draw the density of these lines, right? Does the number of lines mean something? And the answer is kind of yes and kind of no. There's no set rule that these, like, oh, eight lines means it's this charge. 
we look at them relative to others. So if I drew another negative charge and its field looked kind of like this, right? Well then if I call this charge one and this charge two, I can say that Q1 must be greater than Q2 because there are more field lines. It's a relative thing, right? I can also say that the field at A, if we're ignoring the bottom one here, the field at A is greater than B, not just because it's closer, but because the field lines around it are more densely packed. To show that a little bit more, imagine we look at you know some sort of a window, and in this window we see electric fields, right? And the electric fields look kind of like this. We don't know what the source of charge is. We don't know any of that. And it looks something like this. And I look at two points. I look at point A here, and I look at point B here. And you're asked, where is the electric field the greatest? Well, then we can say that EA is greater than EB because the field lines are more densely packed around A than B. One way I like to tell students to do this is, this isn't perfect, but draw a circle of equal radius around the two points. And whichever one has the most lines intersecting that circle probably has the greatest electric field. That is not a universally true thing, but it tends to work. Now, what if we have an arrangement like this? Let's say I have a positive charge here and negative charge here. And I'm going to say that the two charges are equal in magnitude. Well, let's look at a point in the center here. What's the electric field here? Well, I'm going to imagine that I place a little positive charge there. This one pushes it to the right. This one pulls it to the right. So that's my electric field. Now, what about up here? Well, my positive charge here pushes it this way. This negative pulls it down this way. Our vertical components cancel. And so we're left with something like this. Through an argument of symmetry, we can say down here. Over here, it's pushed by the positive more than it's pulled by the negative. Here, it's pulled by the negative more than it's pushed by the positive. And so you end up having this nice long arc like this. And in fact, this thing would extend in these big swooping arcs around, just like that. And I can do the same thing, right? I can say, okay, here's point A, here's point B. Where is the field greatest? Well, A has the most lines around it, so EA is greater than EB. Run out of paper here. Now, if we have something like positive and positive, what would that look like? Well, I'm going to leave that one up to you, and what I really want you to consider is what a point here would do, what a point here would do, what a point here would do, right? And what a point up here would do. And what I really recommend you do is go to this website, look up, oh, no, that's not right, excuse me, FET. We've been there before. Um, go to the FET website, they have a bunch of nice simulations, and just in Google type in FET electric field simulation, and I want you to toy around with that and see what you get. All right. Now, there's one other arrangement that I do want to discuss, and that is a parallel plate capacitor. All that this is is a plate like this. So it's like a flat two-dimensional object. We're going to look at it as one-dimensional and like this. And we arrange these things so that this one has a positive charge on it, and this one has a negative charge on it. Well, let's see what the field in here looks like. Take my little positive charge here. If I put it right in the center there, I think it's pretty clear that this quarter of the plate is going to push it this way, this quarter is going to push it this way, this quarter is going to pull it this way, this quarter is going to pull it this way, and so you end up having an electric field that looks like that. A little bit weirder though is if we look down here like that. Well, if I divide my plate like this, you can see that this portion of the plate is going to push it like this. This portion is going to pull it like this. This portion is going to pull it like this. 
and this portion is going to push it like this. So again, those vertical components all are canceling out with each other, and we're simply left with the resultant that looks like this. And again, by a sort of argument of symmetry, you see that's over there. And so if we want to draw these field lines, what we end up having is something like this. This isn't a great drawing, where on the edges they're arcing out like this. And I'm sort of annoyed at myself with how I drew this because I have different densities of lines going across, which isn't an accurate representation. Maybe if I put this here, it'll make it clear. Because inside of here, in between the parallel plate capacitors, we have a uniform E field. Okay, the electric field inside of there is the same. So if I look at two points, A and B, I can state that the electric field at A is equal to the electric field at B. And if I put a C over here, I can say that this is equal to EC as well. So the electric field everywhere inside is the same. When you go outside, it's no longer the same because you have this sort of arcing. Well, if the electric field is the same, I can then say that the electrostatic force is also the same. for a given charge because I know that Fe is equal to Q times E. Well, if this is the same everywhere and I'm using the same charge, the force must be the same everywhere. Okay, so that's it. Uh, sorry, I know that one was a bit on the long side. I hope that uh, it was clear though. Looking forward to our office hours.